morning. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about bounded context, which of course has been mentioned in the previous talks already and uh, will be no doubt mentioned in some of the later ones because, as he said, I think it is one of the real fundamentals, one of the strategic design principles that uh, helps us think at a little higher level about domain modeling. So <clears throat> one way of looking at it, and I think my preferred way, is that bounded context is a natural, uh, a natural implication of the ubiquitous language pattern. The ubiquitous language pattern basically says that when we approach modeling a domain, we're going to try to create a language. We're going to try to come up with a way that we can clearly, concisely express the problems that we're trying to address in that domain and the way that we're going to solve them. And that goes hand in hand with a clear model. Well, if we're going to develop a uh, language, then we have to deal with all the issues that language has, like ambiguity of meaning of words. But another issue is that we have a lot of problems, and they're quite different from each other. And uh, in fact, one of my regrets about the word ubiquitous is that it means everywhere. And it makes people think that what we're looking for, sometimes it makes people think that what we're looking for is a single model that would address all our problems throughout the system. But that's definitely not what we want to do. When I say ubiquitous, I'm really talking about different aspects of software development, that it would be involved in our conversations with domain experts, but also, let's say, in our code at the two extremes. Therefore, on the other hand, in the other dimension, the many problems that we are trying to address, we would not be trying to address them with the same model. And we wouldn't be trying to describe them with the same language. In order to do that, you'd have to have a language as versatile and broad as, say, a natural language. And we don't want that. The complexities we'd have to deal with there. So. We have a lot of problems. We need multiple models and uh, languages. So we try to cluster related problems together and develop languages that address each of these sets of problems in a nice, clear way. So we have more specialized models, more specialized languages. But. Um, then in order to do that, we need some sort of a boundary between where we're going to use these different models and these different languages. So then comes the concept of bounded context. And it does sound like a strange name when you first hear it. You think, oh, well, you know, why does it have such an odd name? But it's really just a straightforward name when you think about what we're talking about about boundaries between different ways of talking. So context, in the way we're using it, is the ordinary use of the word context. It's the way you are understanding the words I'm saying right now. Because you hear the words that I've said already, you already have some background knowledge or some idea of what we're going to talk about today. And you bring that context in, and that allows you to know what the words I'm saying mean. But um, in software, it's just the same. If I showed you one line of code out of a large system, you wouldn't be able to interpret what it means. You couldn't just look at that line of code and say, oh, yes, that's where they you know, finalize the booking. I mean, maybe the line of code says booking.finalize. But of course, you don't really, just by looking at that line, know what that means. So you'd look and see, well, what does the finalize method do? So you're looking for more context. Or you'd look to see what a booking is. And so you expand out from there. Well, when you look at finalize, you discover that it calls some other things. And you keep 
expanding. At each point, though, the words don't just... The words mean something to you, hopefully, something evocative that makes it easier for you to start to put together a picture of what's going on. But one measure of a design is how much of this tracing would you need to do in order to understand, to truly know what was going to happen, to be able to predict that when I call this, this is what will happen. And in highly coupled systems, the answer is you'll have to look at a lot of stuff. And maybe in the end you conclude, I don't think I'm ever going to fully understand what's going to happen. And therefore, I don't dare make any changes. And this is what happens to us in a lot of legacy systems, where we enable this to grow and grow. Now, the bounded context idea says basically, let's limit this artificially and very consciously, not just around the connections within the software, but around the meanings of the terms themselves. If we're going to do the ubiquitous language and clear domain models, we've gone to some trouble to define our concepts very precisely. We want to be able to say, what is, where do these definitions apply? So a bounded context is just literally a context with a boundary. It's a way I can explicitly say that you will encounter this meaning here which isn't the usual way of doing it. In a conversation, I'm not explicitly bounding the context. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we say, for the purpose of this conversation, you know, this word means this. And we do that sometimes. That's a sort of bounded context. But most of the time, you're expected to infer the context just by paying attention to where you are and who you're talking to and what they've already said. And sometimes what they say later, sometimes you don't really understand what someone's saying until you listen a little more. Well, we want to reduce that load on our brain and instead say, look, here's a boundary. In here, these words mean this. These rules are these rules. Now, <clears throat> these are human-made artifacts. So when I say that the rules are consistent and the definitions are consistent, I don't mean 100% consistent. They're as consistent as humans can make things. And then, what kind of boundary would this be? It can be anything that a developer can easily see. So, if I um, am looking at a system that's very database-oriented, and all the software calls into the same database tables and uh, updates those same tables, then it's hard for me to see any boundaries there. But if this part of the system uses this database schema and this part of the system uses that database schema, uh, there's a division I can understand. So, OK, I'm probably in a different context here. And if someone has said, this is a service boundary, and all this stuff is deployed as a piece, and all this stuff is deployed as a piece, there's another boundary. Deployment boundaries, service boundaries, database. All of these are ways of marking off and separating. I mean. If you're both using the same database, you're not, of course, really separated at all. So these can take many forms, but the bottom line is that there has to be a separation, and a developer has to be able to easily see that separation. Now, um, then, of course, the people within that boundary need to agree on some things. They need to agree on what words mean. They need to also agree on some development process, because otherwise they'll get all out of sync and step on each other's toes. Again, I emphasize that this is the level of agreement that humans can do, right? This is not machines agreeing with other machines. And so we have multiple models that address distinct problems, isolated in multiple bounded contexts. And this is a tidy picture, right? And 
Now, first of all, I will say that in a lot of the presentations that you'll see today, people are probably going to emphasize the tidiness that this can bring. So, look, I'm looking at this complex problem. I've decomposed it into several bounded contexts that allow me to create these very clear models and languages that address certain problems. And then they sort of hand over control to the next one. And uh, they do their part of the problem or their problems. And uh, that is the way, I think, that you can do clean design in the real world. Still, a picture this tidy makes me very suspicious. In the real world, when I've been on real projects, things are never like this. Even projects that I've run, though I must admit that there was a time when I thought that if we just tried hard enough, we could make the whole thing like that. But it never happens. It never, ever happens beyond very small sort of example level projects. So, the bounded context is also here to help us with that. Let me go back to what a bounded context is, because <clears throat> I have found over the years that the definition is sort of slippery. It's like trying to grab fog for people sometimes. It's actually one of those concepts, I think, that's so simple that people think, well, that can't be all there is to it, so that it makes it a little hard. I think you already know what it is, but let me clarify with an example here between three things that sometimes get mixed up. So, and uh, because we talk about them at the same time, because they're all very interrelated. So we talk about bounded contexts, subdomains, and organizations, or, you know, which an organization in any sense, like I say, a team. So suppose that we have a very simple bank, and this simple bank has cash accounts and they have credit accounts. They have a software team that works on cash accounts and a software team that works on credit accounts. They work closely with the two business units, one of which deals with cash and one deals with credit. Each one has developed a model and a specialized language so that you talk about a checking account that has deposits and withdrawals. You talk about a uh, credit card that has uh, charges and payments against the balance. So two ways of talking, two models very focused on what they do, a nice clean picture. And how, what's the difference between a bounded context, a subdomain, and an uh, organization? Well, they're, it's very hard to tell in this example because they're all lined up. And this is often the case at the beginning. This is a, sort of our ideal. This is what we're striving for, to line all these things up. That's when we get the tidiness. But the world isn't static. So the, the, although on day one we have these all lined up, at some point there's going to be, in this case I'm going to say, there's going to be a reorganization, a reorg. And because the business people have said, you know, we used to think of credit and cash as our two main areas of our business, but what we've realized is that that's not the way to look at it. Credit and cash are both very intimately related, and they both serve our customers, but our customers divide very much into two segments, into individuals who have bank accounts and credit accounts, and businesses that have cash accounts and credit accounts. So we're reorganizing around the market segments. So now we will have a business unit for uh, business accounts. We'll have a business unit for individual accounts. And of course, we'll reorganize the software teams along the same lines. All right, so now we've reorganized the people. Right, both the business people and the software people are now organized along this new way of thinking about the business. 
What about the, <coughs> so you could say that is a subdomain, a, a different way of breaking the domain down. Instead of breaking the domain down into credit and cash, we're breaking it down into business and personal. What are the bounded contexts now? And just, let's just think about that. What are the bounded contexts? The day that we do the reorg, at the beginning I said, well, the business has credit and cash, and so we'll have bounded contexts, credit and cash. Now I'm saying the business has personal and business, but the bounded contexts are the same as before. The bounded contexts were the way we shaped the software, and the software is still there. Just because we did a reorg doesn't change the software we already have. Now, maybe we intend to start building software around this new concept, around this new division, but we don't have it now. And yet, a lot of times when people reorganize the teams and everything, they behave as if they did. I mean, of course, everyone knows that the existing software is there and the way it's organized, but they don't take it seriously. So, what we have now is unclear stewardship. You know, the, it isn't really clear who's responsible for the integrity of the design of the cash system or the integrity of the design of the uh, credit system. These two distinct teams both have need of both pieces. And they start to do things. There may be features that people have been wanting for a long time. The people who try to do work with businesses have, um, say, well, we need to be able to deposit a whole lot of checks at once, because our business customers need to do that. And meanwhile, the people do a lot of personal, say, Sometimes someone makes a huge deposit and we want to hold it for a few days to make sure that, it's, uh, that it will really be there. But the business people don't care about that. Well, so this is part of the reason we reorganize. They're able to focus, they're able to do these important things. And they're both modifying the same artifact without a tremendous amount of coordination. So here is a metaphor for this. So we have now, so this game I hope is familiar to people. I think it's a strangely universal game, but it's simple enough to understand, right? At, at uh, fairs and things, they run a race, you take two children, and usually it's children. Not always, I guess. And tie one leg together and then they have to run a race. Now, the outcome of the race is determined basically by a balance of speed and coordination, right? So these two that are in front, presumably, they have the best balance. And these two back here, are bal uh, they have a good coordination, but they're slower, so they're not going to win the race. And then you have some who aren't sufficiently coordinated, right? And so that determines who does well in a three-legged race. When we create a situation like this, we have a three-legged race. <clears throat> and so, you know, one of the kids is trying to take a few steps forward, and one takes a few steps forward, and they try to go as fast as they can, so they're going to do some more you know what happens in three-legged races a lot of times. The kids are trying to go faster, and then, you know, they fall down. So what does that look like in software development? Well, so it's something like that. <laughs> this is, we find ourselves in, and if you've never read it, you should Google for the big ball of mud, because it's a wonderful pattern written in the 90s, and it's still online. And we say, well, what happened? What, how did our system get so bad? Well, part of the reason is because it was being pulled in different directions by different people 
who weren't coordinating. They were probably trying to coordinate a little bit, but there's only so much you can do. OK, so I mentioned that ubiquitous language kind of implies bounded context because we want to craft a language that can express our problems very clearly, but our problems are very diverse, so we need more than one language. But still, uh, that's an overly tidy explanation. It isn't just that different problems call for different solutions, though that is true. But also, not everyone agrees on everything. And so if we have one unified way of looking at the world, we can barely move forward unless everyone agrees. And that's like a three-legged race, except maybe I've got one person tied to me over there and another person tied to me over there. So that would be a four-legged race. And if we tie one to each of them, we'll have a five-legged race or whatever. Eventually, you get to a size where no one can even take one step without falling down. So we put ourselves in this situation. But the bounded context allows us to say, not everyone has to agree on everything because you have your model, your whole design is within that boundary. And as long as it doesn't affect me over here, as long as we can agree on the interface between, right? Just that one thing, that's all we really have to agree on. Of course, we don't even agree with our past selves. So as a system evolves, we have to recognize that sometimes the way we did it in the past, a legacy system, you might say, is quite different from a newer system. And if we tie them too tightly together, we corrupt them both. We keep the new system from fulfilling the vision we had for it. And we may undermine what made the old system valuable in the first place. So we can make both of them worse. And then eventually you get to that point, like the picture of the, you know, the sand trap, where you, know, you just are sort of overwhelmed by the mess and you can't do anything. So <clears throat> a lot of us find ourselves starting out in that place. Right? You come in and there's already a mess built up over decades. How can you possibly untangle all that? Maybe we should just start over and build a whole new system. I'm not. I don't have time today to explain why I think that's such a terrible idea. But I will say that bounded context is a technique to be used in a situation like that. So let me talk about now, to wrap up, uh, talk about another example. This is a sort of, let's start out with the way that we do tend to talk about this. We have a problem we're addressing with new models, and we've broken it into two parts. So we have two identified sets of problems, two subdomains, you might say. And we've made two bounded contexts for them. And they're connected. With, that's what the line represents. Perhaps there are messages going between them. And we want some independence between those two. There's some coordination and some independence. And we'll translate those messages going between the two as necessary so that each can have their own language. And yet, we can coordinate around that translator. This is nice. Of course, it wouldn't be two. It would be more than two. But the basic idea is there. But we haven't looked at everything because what well, we need to integrate with Salesforce. Now, Salesforce, of course, exists. And it is what it is. It's a pretty much a clear example of a bounded context. Do we want the stuff that we're doing to be like Salesforce? Or do we want it to be different? Here's an important decision we need to make. So let's say we decide that when it pertains to a Salesforce thing, let's say, you know, customers and how you track customers and give them IDs or whatever, we decided Salesforce has thought that through. Why should we swim upstream when we can just say, let's conform to the way Salesforce does it? So we're going to conform to Salesforce. Now, 
there's another thing in the system that we need to deal with, and that is the old system that did the same thing that the new system does, but in a different way. There's always an old system, no matter what we're doing, because this is 2020 now, and we have software for everything. Everything's already been softwared. So we have to deal with that, and that means we have to decide, well, how does our new system relate to that? Are we going to conform to the legacy application as well? We decided to conform to Salesforce. But if we conform to the legacy system, then why don't we just do it in the legacy system? I mean, the point of creating the new system was to develop new ways of thinking about the problem, right? We don't want to conform. Well, we don't have to because we'll say in our bounded context, we have a new model, a completely different way of thinking. But in between, we have a translator, as we do with all of these. All of these are translators, but this isn't just any translator. It's one we call the anti-corruption layer. Much more robust. Looks at everything going back and forth with suspicion, you might say. Makes sure that the legacy application doesn't corrupt ours and that we don't corrupt it. Now, um, Here's a metaphor to think about an anti-corruption layer. We're used to this idea that not every, you know, in physical spaces, we don't expect everything to be the same. If you come into a house, here's a sort of strong example of that, where we're expected not to wear the shoes from outside in the house. We might have, <coughs> we might have shoes just for wearing inside the house. This is the place where you take off the outside shoes, perhaps put on inside shoes. And then if you go back outside, you switch shoes again. There's an expectation around a lot of things inside a house versus outside a house. The expectation of how clean the floor will be is one of those. Um, you know, maybe how loudly you talk has changed. There's lots of rules for inside and outside. And this is the place, this is the border, the boundary between those two contexts. Software is much like that. Here's one thing to consider. So I drew that the way we often draw what we call a context map, where we just show all the context, all the bounded context that we're dealing with, and draw lines to show the relationships between them. But, of course, not all of these are really the similar in scale, right? Like if we think about the legacy app and Salesforce, right? The, the legacy app is much bigger than the new thing we're going to build. This is true not all the time. Only 99% of the time is this true. So it's worth remembering that the legacy app is much bigger when you're thinking about how to relate to it. Salesforce, of course, is bigger still. So big that, uh, you know, I thought about just drawing a straight line that crossed the edge of the slide so that I could say that the curvature was just too small to see. But this makes a better visual, really. So we have to deal with these other things. But these translations allow us a place to do that. And that anti-corruption layer, look how big it is. This sometimes alarms people. They're saying, oh, we're building our new system. We're connecting to the legacy system with this anti-corruption layer. But the anti-corruption layer itself is perhaps comparable in size to the new thing we're creating. That doesn't feel right. But I think it is right. Because what would happen if we didn't have the anti-corruption layer, or if we tried to make it artificially simple, is that we would take on the, the uh, issues within our context. Our context would be bigger. It would be as big as the bubble, the circle, and the square put together, but not so clear. It would be fuzzy because we would have elements of the legacy application, the ability to deal with some of its 
complexity here. In other words, we want the new thing to be smaller than the old thing. And the thing that enables that is real isolation. So that when you're working on the whizzy new app, you really don't have to think about how it was done in the legacy system. That, though, puts a great burden on the translation. Each of these translators is an actual piece of software. These are not just conceptual diagrams. They translate into real software. Software that does just one thing. It takes information from one subsystem and transforms it and puts it in another subsystem. If it's a messaging architecture, that's a little easier because that just means it receives all the messages and then emits other messages. But if it's not a messaging system, it does it some other way. Maybe it queries the legacy applications databases and then somehow interprets that in the form of messages that it sends to the new system. Whatever it does, it may be arbitrarily complex. I mean, there comes a point where it's just too much, and then you have to say, all right, we can't have that model. We can't do it that way in the new system. But there's a pragmatic trade-off. Each of these three, on the, uh, in contrast, the conformist has a very simple translator. It knows enough to take information in the form Salesforce gives and scrub it a little bit and reorganize it a little bit and pass it in. But there's not too much to do here because we've decided that we will follow Salesforce's lead. So conceptually, it's not making any big changes. So we could be actually deploying these separately. If these were all microservices, the translators themselves could be microservices deployed in the system. Or they could be built into the new systems either way, but within that, they need to be very apart in the design. OK. So basically, if we say we want language, we need context. Right? That just goes with language. We want our models to be focused. And we want the stewardship to be clear. And we want to acknowledge that the whole world isn't going to be tidy. So we need to be able to create islands of order within that very messy sea of uh, possibly mud. And so basically, the bounded context is a pragmatic thing that allows us to do elegant designs in real situations and not just talk about it and not create problems for people who are trying to get their jobs done. So basically, in order to do it, you need to be pretty serious about those boundaries. You do have to take off your shoes when you come in the door every time and or be ready to mop up afterwards. Right? And you need to be ready to do a lot of translation, possibly more than the new software itself. And that is my short explanation of bounded context. I hope that will be helpful and useful to you. And enjoy the rest of the talks. <laughs>